Welcome back to the Tour Breakaway. We're back in the Manhattan studio, and today, if you're watching, if you're watching on the YouTube, you can see I got uh, I got umbrellas on the shirt because it's just going to be a rain in Classics Riders this weekend. Get your Chianti ready. We're going to Tuscany, back at Strada Bianchi, just I don't, what, seven, seven months or so since we were last over there. I mean, it's like, does it get any better than this? Absolutely incredible. So just an absolute heavyweight battle coming up this weekend in Strada Bianchi. Quick breakdown. We're going to look at the contenders, and I'm going to run you through my favorites. Um, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to go right to it. Um, by the way, if you're, if you're not watching, maybe you should try it. I'm posting everything to YouTube now. So uh, hop on there, give us a subscribe. Would really appreciate that. I'm um, going to start raising the production quality on those a little bit as well. Um, and if you prefer listening, that's cool too. But if you haven't given us a rating, please do that. Would really appreciate it um, tremendously. So appreciate that. Uh, okay, so let's get into it. First man up, Wat Van Art. And I can just imagine everybody greeting Wout with one of those Hello, Wout. Nice to see you again. Uh, because really, nobody's happy to see Wout Van Art after uh, just an awesome campaign last year. Looking so good. Uh, coming off a really impressive uh, training camp. He was out there with Primo's Roglic. They were just absolutely destroying the roads. He's beaten all his, you know, over a dozen of his previous best efforts. He's looking great. And, you yeah, know, there's some debate. Hey... He hasn't raced yet this season. Maybe he's a little rusty. Look, that's wishful thinking. <laughs> Everyone's in trouble. Uh, and let's pull out the receipts here. Wout's done this race three times, and he's been on the podium each time. Uh, he's got this one dialed in. He went third, third, and then he won it last year, looking absolutely stellar. So, When you win Strada Bianchi on a Bianchi, you're just not messing around. So it's over to Cervello for him in the black and yellow, but the result is going to sting just the same. Wow, another top three. And I'll tell you what, I'm mentioning him first because I think he's going to win. So he's number one. And look, this isn't going to be too controversial of a top three for me. Um, I guess I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. I'm actually going to go in order of who I think the top five are going to be. Uh, his greatest nemesis. Moving on, Matthew Vanderpool. And yeah, you know he's a legit contender here. 1,000% he is. He's an absolute beast, snapping his handlebars out on the roads. Um, look, you can't worry about the, his like Kern Brussels Kern tactics, you know, that long range attack that got reeled in, you know, whatever. I don't think he really cared about that race. Look back at, but, but point is, this is a guy that can go 80 kilometers off the front and hold that thought because it's important. Look at his opening stage at the UAE Tour. Remember this, you know, he's strong enough to get into the front echelon. Remember that he's out there with Fernando Gaviria, who had his lead-out man. He's out there against David Decker, who won the points jersey over the course of the tour and had multiple runner-up runner positions in that race. Gaviria was too scared to take him on at the line and did some long-range attack because he's feared MVDP. And Vanderpool beat Decker mano a mano. So this guy's got the distance and the speed. It all checks out. He's coming off... Uh, fourth cyclo world title uh he did very poorly here last year but last year he really underperformed massively in the whole first half of the road season well the the very early road season and then the resumed road season right he didn't win until late at Torino adriatico which was like september 13th now that excludes winning the netherlands road race so put that one aside but um Last year, in the first eight stages of his season, he never finished inside the top ten. Right? That included five, all five stages at the Algarve, Strada Bianchi, where he didn't do well, Milano Torino didn't do well, Milan San Remo. He was outside the top ten at all of them. Uh, he was then, and then he started to turn things around. He was third at Grand Piemonte, tenth at Lombardia, but that's just not great. Uh, it wasn't until he got some momentum at, uh, you know, and then he, later he on went on to win a stage and the the Bink Bank Tour over, overall, second 
uh, raced well in uh, Liege Best on Liege. He was second at Brabrance, uh, and then he won that epic Flanders battle. But it's been all up and up from there. So regardless of how he started the season last year, he's on a different level now. And this four-time world champion of cyclocross is on the podium for me for the first time at Strada Bianchi. Chalk it up. Um, and then the Campion del Mundo, Julian Alaphilippe. He's been all over the roads. And I thought this was interesting. He actually said he's not feeling exactly like he did when he won in 2019. Okay. I mean, looks to be in pretty good form to me. Uh, way better in the, than the form he started in last year. Um, so I think he's good to go. It's really just a matter of how he races. Because he, he almost looks careless in, in his approach on the bike. Um, not very tactical. And, um, you know, last year, this was one of his first, if not his first race back, right when they launched that uh, that massive specialized marketing campaign for the SL7, you know, the one bike to rule them all. And it was at Strada Bianchi that it turned out to be six flat tires that'll ruin your race uh, for Alaphilippe. It was, like, unbelievable. It's like they, they came out with this bike. And they're like, this is the greatest bike in the world. And the first day he rode it, he got six flat tires. I mean, that's what you get from a $12,000 bike that, that doesn't have tubeless tires. That's what you get. So, anyway, I ain't buying that bike. But um, regardless, you know, it, he didn't look good here last year, but six flat tires... I would have given up. I would have, I would have packed it in for the day. Um, to coin a quick step, they're sending a good team, as they always do. Um, they've got Stebar. They've got Ballerini. They've got Almeida. But, look, it, it's not going to be a day for Ballerini. Like, this isn't going to be a sprint. It's not going to be a day for Almeida. Like, he, he, I get that he's improving. These are all guys that are going to work for Alaphilippe. You know, maybe you send... Stebar, all made on an attack, something like that. I don't know. They're going to use some tactics. Hopefully, they use some tactics. Uh, but this is Alaphilippe or bust. Given the competition here this this week, it's Alaphilippe or bust. And honestly, I think when you look at Wild Men are Matthew Vanderpool and Alaphilippe, they're, they're a, a leap ahead of the other folks in this race. And um, it's their podium to lose. Um, now, also in my top five. So moving on. And this is a sneaky pick. Because, you know, I look around, not really, I don't know why people are sleeping on this. Tim Wallens, uh, he's just looking awfully good at the start of the season. He had a great solo effort to win at Passage. He had a really good punchy time trial at the end of that race as well. Um, and look, that's that's what you need. It, it, in this race, you, you need to be able to get off the front. In the last you know, 14 years that they've been doing this race, 10 times it's somebody who's really winning it solo. Um so you got to have demonstrated, for, for me, if you're going to win this race, you got to have shown already that you're able to able to attack and get off the front solo uh, because odds are that's how you're going to win this race. So Wellens, having a great season, he's raced here twice, both top tens, including a third. Just saying. I got him, I got him looking, at, uh, looking at a top five. Now, turning over to UAE, first off, where's Mark Hershey? Has, has anybody seen Mark Hershey? Like, he should be here for UAE. I mean, he's the winner of La Flesh alone last year, second at Liege Best on Liege in that cluster F of a finish. Uh, but, like, where's he at? Why isn't he racing yet? Uh, there's really not too much press on him. So, I mean, it looks like he's going to turn up in Spain, like, later in the month, maybe. But, I don't know, he left DSM, you know, left, uh, DSM for this big contract with UAE. Like, put the man on the roads. And honestly, they could have used him um, in this type of race, given that he's, he's demonstrating some, some capability in, in classics and monument style races. So either way, they're sending Davide Formolo and Tade Pogaccia. And for me, this is a day for Pogaccia. He's got the pop. Time trial on fire right now. Fourth at UAE Tour in the time trial. He was the best climber. Uh, going up Yebel Hafit, Yebel Yace. I mean, he didn't win Yebel Yace, but he was the first one to the line of the rest of the group. He's he's popping right now. So this is a stage where he, or uh, a race where he could really do some damage. And he's really punchier than any GC guy in this race. So of anybody who we consider a GC guy, Pogacar is going to finish the best among them. Um, now, 
he does have a you know an impressive you know an impressive teammate here and and look Pogacar he's kind of held his I mean the thing is he's so young but he's held his own like last year he was he was 13th 12th at Milan San Remo it's not, it's not bad and then he was third at Liege Best on Liege um, he was top 10 at La Flèche Malone yeah it's, it's, it's okay results but look this is a, a further maturing Tadej Pogacar and I mean you go further back he did nothing in the classics in 2019 but at that point I think they were you know just learning how to shave um, he's got Formula with him who I mentioned and look Formula was big last year in races like this he was second here last year which was a real breakout effort for him you know remember he won the stage of Dauphiné but I, I haven't I didn't see that much pop out of him at the UAE tour honestly um, I, I don't think he's in that same form that got him to second last year and I, I think we're looking at a little bit of a different class of riders here today so I, I don't see Formula up there in the top five or top ten or anything like that but I do think this will be a day for Pog as it relates to UAE and I got him in the end of my top five I got him top five uh, now, the next guy, who's just outside of my top five, but he's getting an honorable mention, is the resurgent, at age 34, Buck Malama, who's just aging like fine wine. He's kind of doing a Jakob Fulsang, where he's just getting better once he cracks that age 33. And I don't know what's going on. I mean, you look at this guy, 2018, and 2019, and 2020, over those three years, he really only had one, one real win. At Lombardia, I was in 2019. He won a couple non-World Tour events, but um, you know, just nothing at the World Tour level besides that. But he's been all over the roads in the last couple of weeks. He won uh, Trofeo Laguela this week. Uh, he won a stage uh, that was at a more stacked than normal um, Tour de Alps, Smart Teams, Hot Var, whatever they want to call it, and looked great in Provence. And he's never finished well here, but he's racing better than we've ever seen. Uh, he's racing confidently, he's racing smart, he's getting off the front, and he's got a good team with him. Like, he's got Vincenzo Nibli's here who, look, he's always good for throwing an attack, so you can send him up the road, disrupt things, that's great. Um, you got Tom Scoines here, and you also got Quinn Simmons, the, the young American who's who's um, showing well and hungry to, to lay down some fast miles. So, given the team around him, like, I think he's, yeah, he's going to be in the top ten. You know, I don't think he's going to win it, but I think he's got a good shot at the top 10, which would be a tremendous improvement on, on uh, anything he's done here before. Next, and in my top 10, but not, not in my top 5 and not on my podium, and, and I really disagree. I saw, saw some, something was posted. I think it was on uh, World Tour Cycling. I was like, why Pidcock could win Strada Bianchi? Whoever wrote that is smoking something. Like... Pitcock's, Pitcock, Pitcock doesn't have a shot. Look, Pitcock, Pitcock's great, and it was great to see he got third at uh, at KBK. Solid result. Um, yeah, he's going there with Bernal, Kwiatkowski, apparently Sivakov will be there. And for Ineos, it's his day. But he ain't going to win. Uh, now, I, I don't mean to say that he's going to do poorly. I think he could be top ten. I think it would be a tremendous result if he got top five. I'm not sure it would be top five, but he could be... He could be top 10, um, but it just, I was like flabbergasted. It's definitely clickbait. I mean, if you're saying that, it's just clickbait because like what data would suggest that Tom Pidcock would beat Wout Van Aert and Julian Alaphilippe and Matthew Vanderpool? I mean, you look back to cyclocross. I mean, that's where people are obviously taking this from. They say, oh, well, in cyclocross, he was, you know, he was always third. Yeah, he was always third. You know, he, he never got the best of these guys. And now you're going to you're gonna even suggest that you can beat Wout, where Wout has never not finished on the podium here. I mean, that's just that's just wild. Um, also, a big bummer to point out on the on the Ineo side, Kwiatkowski, thir- like, he had a big tumble. He's, he's all uh, lacerated up, the knee, the sides, the shoulders. Uh, he's got some, he's got a raspberry patch down the whole left side of his body. So... Um, that's a shame. Kwiatkowski is actually the only active rider to have won this race twice. So, you know, he would have been giving it a, giving it a good go. Um, I don't even know if he's going to race. I know he took a day off the bike today to let things heal, but, um, so, so hopefully he can get out there, but you, you know, you, you know, when you know, we're talking about races where, you know, one person, you know, having one, two, three percent of your energy 
diverted to recovery when you just need to be able to put that into your legs, it, it, you know, you just don't come back from that. So um, that's a huge bummer for Kwiatkowski, and it's a, it's a big bummer for Ineos, and it, and it could adversely impact Pidcock because if it was his day, at the, you know, uh, at the end of the day, um, he probably could have benefited from, you know, an optimally healthy Kwiatkowski. So, yep, we got Pidcock on there. He's going to be the guy for Ineos, but he's not going to be, he's not going to be, uh, not on the podium, not top five for me, but love to see him in the top ten. I think that would be a great result. It would be a great result for him. Now, moving on, uh, mentioned him, speaking of uh, Boca Malama finding a resurgence, full, uh, Jakob Fulsang. I mean, he's a contender for me as well, second and fifth in the last two years. I mean, that's solid. Those are solid results. But I'm not, I'm not seeing him quite as strong in the early showings as he was the last two years. He's just not. He's been, you know, he's been getting better and better with age, but um, not quite as poppy as, as we saw last year. Um, yeah, I double, actually, I double back to look at this um, just to validate how good with age he is. Jakob Fulsang, his first 22 classics races of his career, zero podiums. His last four classics races, three podiums. That was all three of his 2019 classics, where he was second here at Strade Bianchi, third at Amstel, and second at La Flesh Wallonne. And then fifth here last year. So even the one that wasn't, you know, the one of those four that wasn't on the podium was fifth. wasn't even a throwaway. That's beast. Uh, you know, he also won a monument in 2019 and 2020, Leach, Bastion, Leisure, and Lombardia, respectively. So Fulsang's going well. He doesn't have the team around him uh, that he did last year. He actually rode well with Vlasov, of all, you know, of all people. He's more of a climber, but um, doesn't really have much help around him, but he's an experienced racer. He'll be in the mix. Um, I don't know if he'll race to win, so I think he should race to be in the. He'll be in the top ten. And then, look, these are the guys on the outside, but we got to mention them. And you know, they're just swapping spots. But this was like all the talk for why he transferred, so we have to talk about him. Roman Bardet now on Team DSM. You know, kind of trying to find this resurgence in his career. You know, he's like, I don't need to be the center of attention. I don't want everybody riding for me. Kind of, said, you know, this whole this whole thing kind of, said, you know, he's trying to find the joy in the whole thing again. It's got to be tough to, you know, be, you know, kind of a darling of France. You, you know, you get second at the Tour de France, and then you start falling back four, six, thirteen, you know, so on and so forth. So look, I, I love the move. Um, but it ain't going to happen. Uh, you know, he's had 31 attempts. He's raced 31 classics. Uh, and he's had one podium. Now, fortunately, as it relates to this race, that one podium was a second place at Strada Bianchi in 2018, which is cool. Um, and that was a good year for him, not including the Tour de France. He was third at Liege Bastion Liege, which is his only monument podium. He was second at Worlds. So that must have been behind uh, Valverde that year. And, um, and that year he also was uh, got a second career podium at the Dauphiné, so it was a great year. Um, so this is all about kind of finding a new form for him uh, with the new look DSM team. But you know, sorry folks, it 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 won't be it for him. I, and if I had a guess, I'm not putting him in the top ten. I'm not. Um, if he is, I'd be delighted to see it. And then lastly, and I'm gonna talk about this guy all the time, Golden Greg, Greg Van Evermont in AG2R. And I gotta talk about him because I just gotta I just gotta keep bringing him up until it finally happens because I believe it's gonna happen, not this weekend, but I believe it's gonna happen. I said he'd win a race this year. Uh, he's just been always the bridesmaid, never the bride. All last year, no wins, and you see him all over the roads already this year. And he just, but he, the final moments, it's just he's just not there to get it done. Um, so I think he's gonna win a race this year. I don't think it's gonna be a classic. It's not gonna be Strada Bianchi. Um, but pretty incredible stat on Golden Greg. He is a classics machine. And 10 times he's ridden Strada Bianchi. Eight times he was in the top 10. I mean, wow. Eight times in the top 10 uh, out of 10 shots. I mean, that's consistency. Now, no wins and only two podiums. But look, we always got to talk about him. Um, but he won't win. So my top five in order. Wout Van Aert, Matthew Vanderpoel, Julian Alphilippe, Tim Wellens, Tadej Pogacar.
We'll see how we shake out. Uh, but yeah, get your wine ready. Stay at home Saturday. If you're in the U.S., relax in the morning. If you're in Europe, enjoy your day watching some lovely cycling. Absolute delight that we get to see this amazing race just twice in like eight, seven, eight months. So uh, enjoy it again. One more plug, please. This is wrapping up. Just click subscribe or leave a rating or subscribe on uh, whichever format you're listening to. I tremendously appreciate it. And, uh, and let me know your thoughts. Love to get some engagement with what you guys think is going to happen because this will be posted more than a day in advance. So let's hear it. And until after this happens, uh, when we break it down, thanks for listening to the Tour Breakaway.